Hello, everyone, and welcome to Arkansas Live. I'm so glad you joined us for today's edition of Arkansas Live. All week, we're going to be talking about how to live life skillfully. So if you need answers to questions, what do I do about this problem? What do I do about this problem? Stay tuned because the Bible has your answer. And I believe the Holy Spirit's going to give you understanding today. So stay tuned. Arkansas Live starts right now. Now, <clears throat> if you were tuned in yesterday, you know that I spent the, uh, Monday's program giving you commentary on where we are now in time. Paul said we're in perilous times. Um, Jesus on the Mount of Olives in Matthew 24 um, said not to be deceived. And he said, you, nobody knows the time of my coming, uh, but in your patience, you possess your soul. So he wanted, warned his disciples, don't get upset, uh, don't get uh, deceived. Keep in mind, and I mentioned this yesterday, the next event on God's calendar is the rapture of the church. Uh, nobody knows the time of the rapture, but we do know what the rapture is and what's going to happen or when it takes place. Jesus is going to call his believers, his company, the church company, the body of Christ. He's going to call them up to meet him in the air. And nobody sees him. He doesn't appear on earth. Uh, the Bible is very clear about that. Uh, the, at the rapture, we're just caught up to meet him in the air. Before the second coming, before he touches back down on the earth. And by the way, for the seven years that we're in heaven with Christ, we're experiencing the judgment seat of Christ, which is our rewards for what we've done in the body and the marriage supper of the Lamb. So we're enjoying seven years of, of, of bliss being in the presence of Jesus, being in heaven. The world, on the other hand, is going through seven years of tribulation. After the rapture, the tribulation will start. Nobody knows when or how long. Could be a day, could be a month, could be a year. But we know all of the events in the tribulation have to be finished in seven years because that's how long we're going to be with Christ uh, in heaven. And the tribulation is going to be a period of seven years. But nevertheless, the things that are going on on the earth, Jesus said in Matthew 24, these things must come to pass. And he said, these are the beginning of sorrows. So everything we're seeing going on uh, in the culture today, in the world today, uh, hence at globalism, uh, the World Economic Forum, WHO. All, all of these things are designed to deceive people into believing the wrong thing. One world government, globalism. You don't want to be a part of any of that. That's going to take place during the tribulation. Not yet. But we're preparing ourselves for the rapture of the church, for the coming of the Lord. We're to stay ready. We're to watch. We're to wait. We're to preach the gospel of grace. The gospel of the kingdom will be preached by the 144,000 Jewish evangelists. After the church is gone, then the uh, Jewish evangelists and 144,000 of them will be anointed by the Holy Spirit and they'll win the rest of the world. It's an amazing thing. That's, that's where the great revival is going to take place. Everybody's looking for a great worldwide revival right now. <laughs> And I've heard people say that it's already begun or the great awakening has already begun. It has, but not like you think. It's not going to be as the Kingdom Now uh, group suggests that we're going to, out of our dominion theology, we're going to take over America. We're going to take over the world. We're going to take over uh, every man's world. And we're going to bring it all into submission. And then Jesus will come back. No, that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that during the tribulation, the 144,000 Jewish evangelists are going to preach the gospel of the kingdom. Church preach the gospel of grace. They're going to preach the gospel of the kingdom, meaning the king is coming. And the awakening has already started because look at Israel, look at uh, even Arab nations are beginning to have visions and dreams and see Jesus and they're getting born again. And the great awakening is already taking place, but not as you suppose. And it will be culminated 
with a great worldwide revival in Revelation 7, it says there's an innumerable company of people without number. You can't number them. Standing before the throne of God, praising God. <laughs> and they asked, John asked, who, who are these people? Where did they come from? The angel said, these are those that were saved out of the tribulation period. They're clothed in righteous holy garments. They're washed with the blood of the lamb. You see, everything that happens in the Bible for the good of humanity didn't just happen to America or in America or for America. Jesus came that whosoever would believe upon him would not perish. The Bible said God so loved the whole world, not just one nation or another nation. And so you have to expand your thinking and start looking at the signs, the seasons that you see, and don't limit them to America or your nation, wherever you're watching, if you're watching by live stream or Roku, and it's not just you. In Revelation 7, it said every nation, every tribe, every tongue, all people, all human beings, Jesus died for, and they're going to find that out. So that great awakening is taking place not necessarily as we American Christians have thought, <laughs> just us four and no more, but no, a whole world. But now globalism is a counterfeit. It's, it's a, uh, how would I say, it is a perversion uh, of the uh, worldwide revival. It is a demand by those that are in authority with money and power uh, they're going to try to control the world. Uh, Bill Gates said in one of his interviews that uh, the, the world would be more sustainable if there were only 500 million people on the earth. And he said, we've got too many people. He doesn't say how he proposes to get rid of all the 8 billion people and whittle it down to 500 million. But there are some people uh, that are in power and money today that could figure out a way. The pandemic was one way to get rid of millions of people. And uh, there may be other uh, challenges. And so all the things that we're seeing now, we shouldn't be afraid of. We should know our, our Bible and our, our history and know that these things must come to pass. The important thing is what are we supposed to be doing as believers, as Christians? And that's why I want to teach you on how to live life skillfully. You don't need to be afraid. You say, well, pastor, I heard we're, we're going to have to uh, seek caves and run to the mountains. No, not you, not the church, not the body of Christ. We'll be in heaven. That scripture is referring to uh, Israel during the tribulation period. He said, take heed or concern that your flight will not be in winter or your, your wife won't be pregnant. Uh, run to the hills and escape. Uh, the hoarding armies uh, of the Antichrist that are stealing, killing, and destroying. And a lot of people believe they're going to be uh, kind of like kind of like in the Old Testament land of Goshen uh, when there was persecution and death and famine. And uh, Joseph uh, put all of his family and the remnant uh, at that time in the land of Goshen where there were no flies, there was no famine, the cattle prospered. And so a lot of people think that in the tribulation period, Israel will flee, will flee to uh, uh, Petra and they will take solace there. They will take uh, provision there until the tribulation is over. And then they'll all uh, be saved and uh, go to heaven with us. I mean, we'll already be there, but they will come and join us. So what are we supposed to be doing? We're supposed to be praying waiting, looking, watching. And I call your attention to 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 13, uh, excuse me, verse 14. But continue in the things which you've learned and have been assured of, knowing of whom you've learned them. The problem is, is that most church people don't know anything about what I have just said the last two days on Arkansas Live. They don't know the history. They don't know what to look forward to. They're afraid. They're depending on 
the 6 o'clock news are there depending on their pastor who's afraid to teach these things or doesn't know about these things. And I hear all the time people are telling me the reason we watch is because we want to know. And uh, VTN is a great resource to us because we learn things uh, on VTN from all the ministries that are there that we don't hear in our churches and we don't see anywhere else. Well, I want you to know how to live skillfully uh, in this world in the beginning of sorrows. No, you're not going through the great tribulation. Not if you're born again, you're going up in the rapture. So you won't be there, but you need to know how to live skillfully in this world until the rapture takes place. Now, the number one thing uh, that I would suggest to you that you learn uh, about is the wisdom of God. You need to know the wisdom of God. Now, God has put his wisdom in his book, and you can start by reading in uh, Proverbs. Let's go to Proverbs, and let's look at chapter 1, learning how to live skillfully. This is in there for a reason. The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, the king of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding. Now, I have underlined wisdom, instruction, and understanding. This is all part of wisdom. This is all part of knowing how to live skillfully. Now, we're talking about God's wisdom. We're not talking about a college degree, which is great, but it's not necessarily the wisdom of God. You didn't learn about God. In verse 3, to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, judgment, and equity. Keeps on going. To give subtlety to the simple, to the young man, knowledge and discretion. A wise man will hear and will increase learning. That's so important. A man of understanding shall attain unto the wise counsels. Uh, we have a lot of young people growing up in the kingdom of God now that they don't have the uh, they don't have understanding of the things of God. They don't know how to interpret the scriptures. And he goes on. He said, a wise man will hear and increase learning and a man of understanding will attain unto wise counsel. To understand a proverb. Now, a proverb by definition is a pithy saying. It's, I guess you could accurately describe it as a word from God, a revelation of God himself his nature, um, his word, to understand a proverb and the interpretation. Uh, proverbs are not there just so you can, you know, make a bookmark out of it and stick it in your Bible. It's there for you to be, in, for it to be interpreted by you, by the Holy Spirit. The words of the wise and their dark sayings. Now, the reason they're called dark sayings is because they're still covered. They haven't been uncovered. A dark saying is something where there has been no light given to it. Uh, that, that, that's a generational phrase. Well, I don't have light on that yet. It means I have no understanding of that yet because the light, and over in Corinthians, it talks about the light of the glorious gospel shall shine unto them. So, if you say, I don't have light on that yet, it means that's still dark. I don't have the understanding of that yet. I don't understand what the scripture means because to me, it's still a dark saying. Next verse, verse 7, Proverbs 1, 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Now, the fear of the Lord is not being afraid of him. It, it, it means the fear of the Lord, the reverence of the Lord, giving him his due, his respect his reverence uh, is the beginning of knowledge but fools despise wisdom and and instruction my son hear the instruction of your father forsake it not nor the law of your mother for they shall be an ornament and uh, the uh, marginal reference says an adding this is a plus it's not he's not talking about uh, jewelry per se. 
This shall be an ornament of grace unto your head and chains about your neck. Again, not chains of bondage, but chains of glory, chains of recognizing that God is my everything. He's my wisdom, my knowledge. My son, uh, he said, you shall uh, be an or uh, I mean, the wisdom of God, the the instruction of your father, the law of your mother will be an ornament of grace to your head and chains about your neck. Now, now let me read this for there, there might be some younger folks listening here. My son, if sinners entice you, consent thou not. I like to give you personal examples sometimes. Um, every child of God is tempted and suckered and deceived in some way, sometime in their life. And he's saying here, my sons, and let me just say, my teenagers, my 20-somethings, uh, if, if sinners entice you, consent thou not. Don't consent to their temptations. Now, I remember when um, I was in high school, and uh, the, the, the big thing in those days, in the 50s, the big thing uh, that we were faced with was smoking. And some of the kids did. Most of them did not. But the bunch, bunch that I ran around with did. They all smoked. I did not. And uh, we would run around together. Uh, one of the guys had a big old car. It was like a 49 Chevrolet. It was big as a tank. And we'd all go riding up and down, go to the Dairy Queen, go to the hamburger joint. He'd take some of the guys to school. And uh, it, it was a, a fun time. And we were carefree and, you know, the, the war had been over for 10 years and our parents were home and uh, America was prospering and there was revival in the land, even though we didn't know what it was. And it was a good time uh, to be alive. It's accurately portrayed in the old TV uh, sitcom Happy Days. And uh, so, you know, we, we just thought this was a, a wonderful life. But I was pushed into smoking to become part of the group. And young people want to be part of the in crowd. I didn't want to smoke. So I rejected it and refused it. Well, one day uh, they played the game, what they call smoke out. Everybody in the car lit up, filled the car full of smoke. And I'm back there hacking in the back seat. And I thought, I'm not going to smoke. If I smoke, it's going to be because I want to, not because I'm forced to. So when they pulled up to the next stop sign or traffic light, I opened the door and jumped out. Got a, Just jumped out while the car was still just a little bit moving and, and walked off. I did not consent to that. Uh, when people Now, there were no drugs that I knew of. Back in the 50s, we didn't know what drugs were. We knew they were in New York City, but we didn't have them in Arkansas at that time. But smoking was a big deal, and I refused to let somebody force me. I considered not to their enticement. You can stand uh, in faith. You can stand uh, for God. You don't have to submit to all the stuff that goes on in your culture, in your school, or in your um, you know social media platforms. You don't have to that you don't you can say no to that just say no i'm not going there and that is not me and and i'm not going to be forced to to do it believe you me those that are trying to entice you will have respect for you uh, they may say they don't or they may curse you or ostracize you and you can't come in our in our company anymore but they will respect you because of uh, what you stand for you stand for righteousness and reverence I know my dad used to tell me all the time, he'd say, now, son, because my natural response to him when I wanted to do something and he would say, no, I'd say, but everybody's doing it. <laughs> you probably heard that or said it before. And I said, everybody's doing it. He said, no, everybody isn't doing it. If everybody was going down to jump in the Arkansas River, would you go with them? Well, no. He said, well, just because everybody's doing something doesn't mean you have to do it. Now, let me revert back to this. And this is not nostalgia or old-fashioned. This is the wisdom of God. Listen to verse 8. 
talking about how to live skillfully. My son, hear the instruction of your father and forsake it not. Now, if there was ever anything that is true. Now, I know we live in a culture where absentee fatherism, a lot of kids don't have fathers. Fathers have run off. They've abandoned the family. They're drunkards. They're whatever. Uh, or they're just not there. But that isn't the way God designed it. God designed for the family to be the crux of his instruction and wisdom. He, he didn't expect you to have to learn from counselors or athletes or uh, movie actors or anybody else that you have adopted as a mentor. He, he expected for your mentors and your instructors to be your parents. Notice it says, uh, your father is to give you instruction. You've heard the story of the little boy who fell off his bicycle, scraped his knee, he runs to the house. Who does he go? He cries for mama. Mama, mama, why? Mama's going to love him and kiss him and pray for him if she's a Christian and put a Band-Aid on it. Father is going to come in there and give him a lecture on how to ride a bicycle without falling. And people make fun of that, and, and psychologists have used that to twist things. No, that's the job of the father. The father is to be the instructor. He's to demonstrate God. He's to demonstrate what's right and what's wrong. And that's what's wrong with America right now is because the family has dissolved into almost nothing. This is the rest of this. It says, hear the instruction of your father and forsake not the law of your mother. Now, he's, uh, he, he's not referring to laying down the law. The father usually does that. But he's talking about the mother is to establish the routines, the behavior. My mother did that. She taught us social graces, if you want to use those terms. She taught us to pull out chairs for the young ladies when they're seated. Uh, she taught us to open the door first for the female. He, she taught us uh, to be obedient to our school teachers, which of most were women. And she taught us these things. The law of your mother. I remember uh, when I was in high school, of course, I had a curfew. I'd go to the ball game on Friday nights, but I had to be home before midnight. And uh, when I, I didn't have a car in the beginning, uh, so I'd ride with my friends. But when I got my own car, I had to be home before midnight, and my father would remind me. And so my mother uh, depended on me to be home uh, before midnight because she w was worried about me. Well, I remember one night I was going home after a ball game, and I had a wreck in my car. I went around the corner too fast and busted the wheel and the axle, and I had to walk home. And in those days, that was no big deal. <laughs> we walked to school sometimes, and then there was no crime to speak of. We never locked our door at night. And I know some of you are thinking, oh, my Lord, did you live in a dream world? Well, in a sense, yeah, we didn't, walk, we didn't lock the door because crime was not, uh, an, it was not an issue. And so I walked home. <clears throat> I opened the carport door because it wasn't locked. They never did. We never did lock the doors to the house, even when we went to sleep at night. And so I walked in and I opened the door and I walked into the den off of the carport. And all of a sudden, there was my mother sitting in the corner in a chair praying. <laughs> It like to have scared me. I said, Mama, I said, what are you doing still up? And she looked at me like only a mother can and said, I was waiting for you to come home. I just wanted to make sure you were all right. Are you all right? Did anything happen? Well, of course, I had to, you know, explain to her what happened. And, of course, she loved me and all that kind of stuff. Then we went to bed, of course. The next morning I had to tell Daddy, and that's when I got, that's when I got, <laughs> the, the, 
the lesson, the preaching he instructed me. Well, that was his job. And she did her job, and he did his job. My father was a leader in the community. He was the scout master in our Boy Scout uh, chapter at church. My mother sang in the choir. Daddy was a uh, part of the Junior Chamber of Commerce. He, he was involved. He was involved in the community and raised his family, me and my sister. And he made no, he didn't slack off on my sister just because she was a girl, two years younger than me. She learned by watching how he dealt with me. <laughs> she had the benefit of seeing uh, what to do and what not to do, how to act and how not to act. Uh, so what I'm saying to you, uh, if you're going to live skillfully, you're going to have to live according to the Word of God. What does the Word say? And let's go to verse 11. If the sinners say, come with us, let us lay wait for blood, uh, let us lure, uh, lurk, excuse me, privately for the innocent without cause. And he said, let us swallow them up alive as the grave and whole as those that go down to the pit. We shall find all precious substance. We shall fill our houses with spoil. Now, this is juvenile delinquency, if you want to say it that way. He said, cast your lot uh, among us and let us all have one purse. And the, the wisdom of God is, talking about learning to live skillfully, it says, my son, walk not thou in the way with them. Refrain thy foot from their path, for their feet run to evil and they make haste to shed blood. So he was, he was given instruction and wisdom. How do you live skillfully? You walk away from that. You don't partake of it. That's good advice. You, you'll, you'll have to do that all through your life, not just when you're a teenager refusing to be made to smoke, to join the crowd, to do the things that they're all doing. But when you get older and you start college, it won't be anybody there to tell you what to do. You can do what you want to do. And then when you start working, start your family, you have to live skillfully by living by the Word. Now, join me again tomorrow uh, for Arkansas Live. And remember, Jesus is Lord of Arkansas and where you're watching too. Send your questions, comments, and testimonies to Happy Caldwell at Post Office Box 26207, Little Rock, Arkansas, 72221, or email happycaldwell at vtntv.com. Remember to follow VTN on Facebook at VTN Your Arkansas Christian Connection and follow Happy Caldwell on X at Happy underscore Caldwell. VTN is on Roku. Search VTN in the channel store and add us to your lineup. Today's episode is available to watch on demand at VTNTV.com and click watch. You can also watch VTN via live stream at VTNTV.com.